Okay. Um, Okay, good. All right, so if you have a solution with a volatile solute, then you have to worry about the vapor pressure of each component, okay? So if you have a two components, A and B, both volatile, right? Both with vapor pressures, then the pressure of A above the solution is just equal to the mole fraction of A times the vapor pressure of pure A. And the vapor pressure of component B is just equal to the mole fraction of B times the vapor pressure of pure B, right? And the total pressure is equal to PA plus PB. Solutions that behave this way are called ideal solutions. And ideal solutions follow Raoult's law for both components, okay? So here's a little graph for an ideal solution that shows the vapor pressures of the components and the total vapor pressure, right? So here I'm plotting mole fraction of A. Uh, so this one, in other words, when mole fraction of A is zero, then the solution is what? All B. When the mole fraction of A is one, the solution is all A, right? So let's just deal with the endpoints for a minute here. When the solution is all B, right? Then the vapor pressure is just the vapor pressure of B, which is right here, okay? When the solution is all A, the vapor pressure of the solution is just the vapor pressure of, of pure A, right? As we would expect, okay? Now, for an ideal solution, at, at compositions where you have both components, right? You can see that the vapor pressure uh, is given by this curve. It's just the sum of the two, right? So in other words, at exactly half, right? So then when the solution is 50-50, 50% A, 50% B by mole fraction, right? Then the vapor pressure of A is 50% of the vapor pressure of pure A, right? And the vapor pressure of B is just 50% of the vapor pressure of pure B. And then the vapor pressure of the solution is just the sum of those two, which is right here. Does that make sense? So notice as you increase the amount, as you go from pure A to pure B, the vapor pressure goes from the vapor pressure of pure A and it decreases, decreases, decreases until it gets to the vapor pressure of pure B, right? Everybody with me? Okay, now, turns out that real solutions don't always follow uh, Raoult's law for both the solute and the solvent. And that's because of the differences in the strength of solute-solvent interactions compared to the strength of solvent-solvent and solute-solute interactions, the kind of, the kind of uh, interactions we were talking about earlier in terms of solution formation, all right? So let's look at what some of these deviations look like. So in this case, the dotted lines are showing the ideal behavior, which we just saw over here, okay? And what you see here is in the case of strong solute-solvent interactions, in other words, when the solute-solvent interactions are stronger than both the solute-solute and solvent-solvent interactions, all right, notice that the vapor pressure is lower than that predicted by Raoult's law. In other words, when you mix the solute and the solvent together, those stronger interactions between the solute-solvent compared to solute-solute, solvent-solvent, those stronger interactions hold the molecules together in solution and therefore you have less vapor pressure than predicted by Raoult's law. Are you with me? On the other hand, if the solute-solvent interactions are weak compared to solute-solute and solvent and solvent-solvent, then the vapor pressure of the mixture, because when they're mixed, the interactions are now weaker, right? Now the vapor pressure is actually higher than what you would predict based on Raoult's law. Right? So Raoult's law kind of assumes that all the interactions are the same, but that's not true all the time. Okay? So let's do a quick example of this. Uh, so here we have a solution of methanol and water. Um, 
Uh, and we're given, we're given that the mole fraction of water is equal to 0 0.312. And we're given that the total vapor pressure of the solution is 211 torr at a given temperature. And we're given that the vapor pressure, the vapor pressure of pure uh, methanol and pure water are equal to 256 torr and 555.3 torr, all right? And it's asking us, is the solution behaving ideally, right? Is it behaving ideally? So what we wanna do is we wanna go back and say, okay, let's calculate the vapor pressure of each component as if it was behaving ideally. And let's see how that compares to the actual vapor pressure that's given here, right? That's what we wanna do. So let's start by calculating the vapor pressure of water, which is gonna be equal to the mole fraction of water times the vapor pressure of pure water. And that's gonna be equal to 17.2. And then let's calculate the vapor pressure of the methanol. So if, if it was 0 0.312 mole fraction of water, right, then we know that it's one minus that or 0 0.688 mole fraction of methanol. Now we use the vapor pressure of pure methanol, 256 torr, right? And we get that the vapor pressure of methanol is 176.1 torr. So we would predict for an ideal solution, we would predict that P total is equal to 17.2 plus 176.1, uh, which is equal to 193 torr. Okay. So what do we find? The ideal, if they were behaving ideally, we would expect the vapor pressure to be 193 torr, right? But the actual vapor pressure that was measured was 211 torr, right? So the actual vapor pressure is greater than what we would predict for an ideal. So which of these three cases do we have, A, B, or C? Weak solute solvent. Correct, C, right? We have C. The, 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 because notice the vapor pressure we calculated, right, is 193. That's the ideal solution would be here. But the actual vapor pressure is 211, which is higher, right? So that's telling us that the solvent solute interactions are weak compared to solute, solute, solvent, solvent. Does that make sense to everyone? Yes. So wait, can you go back to the graphs? Yeah. Um, for the ideal solution. Yes. Would it just be like a not not a strong solute solvent interaction, not a weak one, like like an intermediate one? Yeah, they would all be the same. The key is how does the solute solvent interaction compare to the solute solute solvent solvent? If they're all the same, then you get an ideal solution, right? Because basically what you have is something like this, right? You have, let's say, this is your solute. This is your solvent. Let me just color these in, right? And they have certain intermolecular forces, right? The strengths of those intermolecular forces determines the vapor pressure, right? Now, when you mix them, right? Then you got, now the question is, now you got these interactions, right? Between the solute and the solvent. If those are weaker, than these, then that's gonna result in more vapor, right? If those are stronger than these, 
that's going to result in less vapor, right? It's the presence of these new interactions, right, that has the potential to change it from what you would expect for an ideal solution. In an ideal solution, these interactions, these interactions, and these interactions are all the same. And if that's the case, then you get this kind of behavior, right? But if these are stronger or weaker than these, then you get different behavior, right? Does that make sense? Yeah. Are there any examples of like an ideal solution or does it not exist? Uh, totally. Something like two hydrocarbons mixed together are pretty ideal, like hexane and, and pentane, for example. Yeah. So what this is telling you, what this is telling you for this example that we just did, what it's telling you is that the is that the water water interactions and the methanol methanol interactions are stronger than the methanol water interactions. Right. That's what it's telling you. Does that make sense? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. You're welcome. Okay. Let's try this. Okay, just delivered it. Okay, go ahead and throw in an answer here in the next in the next few seconds. All right, the right answer was B. All right, and uh, the reason you know that is because if you think about this, there's equal amounts of moles in both of A and B, right? So. The vapor pressure of A is 100 and that of, two, of B is 200. So if it was an ideal solution and you have equal moles of both, what would be the vapor pressure of the solution? Right, it'd be directly in between the two vapor pressures, right? If it was, if it was a, an ideal solution, its vapor pressure would be 150. The experimentally measured vapor pressure is 120. 
So what does that tell you? That the solute solvent interactions are stronger than the other two interactions, right? Because the actual vapor pressure of the solution is lower than what you would predict for an ideal solution. In other words, in this case, we have situation B, right? Where the vapor pressure is lower than what you would predict. Okay, questions? All right. Again, thank you for your patience with this format. Um, you guys are really patient with me and I, I, I so appreciate it, I can't even tell you. Okay, uh, let's move on to our last topic uh, for this chapter and it's titled Colligative Properties, although vapor pressure is also a colligative property. But the, the three that I wanna talk about here are uh, melting point, or let actually call it freezing point. So freezing point, depression, and uh, boiling point, elevation. And then we'll also talk about um, another colligative property called osmotic pressure. And we'll get to that in a minute. But let's start with a phase diagram. So remember, phase diagram is a plot of pressure versus temperature that tells us what state the substance is in, right? So for a pure substance, right? Follow the lines here in blue, okay? So this is the pure substance. You have uh, a liquid, solid, and a gas. And then I want you to think about what happens when we add a solute to that solvent. Well, what do we know about the vapor pressure? When we add a sol solute to the solvent, what happens to the vapor pressure? We've just been talking about that. The vapor, how does the vapor pressure of a solution compare to the vapor pressure of the pure solvent? Does the vapor pressure of the solution go down or does the vapor pressure of the solution go up? Please answer. It should go down. Thank you. <laughs> it should go down, right? The vapor pressure should go down. So in a phase diagram, what does that look like? it looks like a lowering of the vapor pressure curve. So now the vapor pressure curve, instead of being here, is here, right? Because the vapor pressure is lower, right? But because the triple point must move with that, right? Look what happens to the phase diagram for the solution compared to the pure, the pure liquid. This is at one atmosphere, right? And this represents the freezing point or the melting point right? And look what happens to the freezing point. It gets lower for the solution, right? And look at the, look at the boiling point. The boiling point gets higher, okay? So because of this vapor pressure lowering, it shifts the melting point to a lower temperature and the boiling point to a, a, a higher temperature. So in other words, a solution remains liquid over a larger temperature range than the pure substance, yeah? So the freezing point is depressed and the boiling point is elevated, okay? And the, react, the, the, the equations that give us that are delta TB is equal to IM times KB. This I here is the same I we talked about before, right? For ionic solutes. M is the molality of a solution. So this is the unit of molality, not molarity. Important to keep that in mind. And this is a constant that depends on the solvent. Right? And this is the decrease in the, uh, sorry, I want to do, I want to make this one on. Uh, let's see, that's, I want to make this the Delta TF, sorry, Delta. Well, it doesn't matter. This is, this is boiling, this is boiling point. This is freezing point. Delta TF is equal to I M times KF, right? Same thing. This is a constant that depends on it. This is the molality. This is for ionic solutes. And this is, this is the um, decrease in the decrease in freezing point. 
This is the increase in boiling point. Sorry, this is a little messy. Um, but you can see these two equations right here. And those are the ones that give you that. OK, now, it's important to understand in the past, when we've done delta anything, right, it's always delta final, like delta x is x final minus x initial, OK? This is the one place where, by convention, they don't take into account the sign, all right? So really, in both these cases, this is the absolute value of the change in temperature for boiling and melting, all right? You just have to know, for, for, for freezing, it goes down. For, for boiling, it goes up, OK? Um, these are the constants for freezing and boiling for a number of different sub for a number of different uh, solvents. All right, so you can see for water here, this is the one we'll use the most. The freezing point constant is 1.86 degrees Celsius per molal, and the boiling point is 0.512 degrees Celsius per molal. Right, so that tells you that a one molal solution, if it's molecular and I is one, right then for a one molal solution, the boiling point of water is gonna be what? 100.512 degrees Celsius, right? Cause this constant is 0.512. So if this is one, the boiling point is gonna be 100.512 Celsius. The freezing point is gonna be what? Who can tell it to me from this table? For a one molal solution of a molecular solute. What's going to be the freezing point? Anybody? Zero. Uh, zero would be the pure solvent. So zero would be pure water. So let's just calculate it. One molal right? Delta TF is equal to I times M times KF. I is equal to one for a molecular solvent. M is one. KF is 1.86, right? So this is molal degrees Celsius per molal. That cancels it. So the change in freezing point is just 1.86 degrees Celsius, right? So if the freezing point of pure water is zero, what's the freezing point of the solution? Negative 1.86. Negative 1.86. Very good. Okay, good. So that's why, for example, uh, if you live on the East Coast or if you've been to the East Coast in the winter, you know that they salt the roads, right? They add salt to the roads. Why do they do that? The salt lowers the freezing point of water, right? So that it can, so even though it's below zero, the ice can melt, right? Uh, this is also the same reason that we saw with antifreeze and frogs that we talked about at the very beginning, where frogs flood their cells with glucose, right? This creates a solution with a lower freezing point, and therefore they can survive the winter without their cells freezing, right? Okay, let's do another example. Uh, an here we have an aqueous solution. It has 35.9 grams of some unknown compound um, in 150 grams of water. And it has a freezing point. Freezing point equals minus 1.3 degrees Celsius. So delta TF is just equal to 1.3 degrees Celsius. So remember, delta TF is the um, magnitude of the, of the change, not the sign. Okay, and we want to find the molar mass, right? And remember that molar mass is grams per mole, all right? So we're given the grams of the compound. So we already know the numerator. We just have to figure out the number of moles, right? So we can figure out the number of moles from the information they gave us, right? So we're going to use delta TF is equal to KF times M, right? They told us what delta T was. We know KF, so we can solve for M. 
So M is equal to delta TF over KF, right? Which is equal to 1.3 degrees Celsius over 1.86 degrees Celsius per molal. So we get that the molality of the solution is 0 0.699, two sig figs. With me? Then to get the number of moles, because remember we got, we got grams per moles, grams are already given, so we're trying to get to moles. So we know that the solution is 0.699 molal, right? So we know the number of kilograms of water, so we can go 0 0.150 kilograms of the solvent, right? Times um, 0 0.699 moles per kilogram, right? And that gives us 0 0.1048 moles, okay? Does that make sense? So then the molar mass is equal to zero point, uh, sorry, 35, 35.9 grams divided by 0 0.1048 moles, right? And uh, that comes out to be 340 grams per mole. We only get two sig figs, so there's really should be 3.4 times 10 to the two grams per mole. Does that make sense? Awesome. Great, 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 great. Uh, I think it's pretty straightforward. So I think I'm just going to skip it and uh, talk about osmotic pressure. OK. Um, So if we go back to our principle that a solution is thirsty and will draw pure solvent to itself, right? And we consider a setup like this, all right? Here you have a U-shaped tube. You have a semi-permeable membrane in the middle, all right? Here you have a concentrated solution, and here you have pure water. The membrane allows water molecules to pass, but it does not allow solute particles to pass. Based on our idea, right, that a solution is thirsty, which direction would you expect water molecules to go? Towards the left or towards the right? To the left. To the left, correct. So water molecules are gonna go through the semi-permeable membrane into this thirsty solution. And what's gonna happen is that the water level here is gonna rise, and the water level here is going to fall, OK? And that will keep happening until the pressure due to this column is equal to the osmotic pressure of the solution, OK? And the osmotic pressure is given by pi. And the equation that gives us osmotic pressure, and let me not forget I there, is I m r t. All right, so this is the osmotic pressure. T is the temperature in Kelvin. R is just the gas constant. Uh, M is the molarity of the solution, right? And I is for ionic solutes, right? So uh, I for a molecular solute is always one. For something like sodium chloride, it'd be two and so on, okay? I isn't 3.14, it's just like a variable? Yes, exactly right. So this is the capital P pi, and uh, it stands for osmotic pressure, okay? Um, so the, the, usually we use the small, the lowercase pi um, for 3.14. We ran out of letters, so we have to start reusing them. Um, all right. Let's calculate the osmotic pressure of a solution containing uh, 18.7 milligrams of hemoglobin in 15.0 milliliters at 25 degrees. And the molar mass 
we're given as 6.5 times 10 to the four grams per mole, all right? So this is fairly straightforward. All we gotta do is, is, is calculate the, the molarity of the solution, right? So molarity is equal to moles over liters. So let's get the moles. Moles is equal to 18.75 times 10 to the minus three grams times 6.5 times 10 to the fourth grams per mole. So the number of moles is equal to 2.88 times 10 to the minus seven moles, right? So the molarity then is 2.88, sorry, I'm going off the bottom here, 2.88 times 10 to the minus seven moles divided by the number of liters. We got 15 milliliters, so that's 0.015 liters. So we get a molarity that's equal to 1.92 times 10 to the minus five molar, okay? And so then we just substitute into this equation, pi, uh, I is just equal to one times the molarity, 1.92 times 10 to the minus five molar times R, 0 0.08206 liter atmosphere mole Kelvin, right? Times what? Temperature, right? Uh, is the only thing we're missing the temperature? What did we say it was? Uh, 25C, which is 298 Kelvin, right? So the Kelvin cancels. Um, this is molarity is moles per liter. So our moles cancel, our liters cancel, and we're at end up with just atmospheres, okay? And so the answer here is um, 4.7 times 10 to the minus four atmospheres, which if you convert that to tor, corresponds to 0.36 tor. So only a very small increase uh, in the, um, uh, the osmotic pressure, right? It's just, it's a small one, why? Because the molar mass of this solute was so high that this many grams didn't provide a very concentrated solution, right? But you can see how, the, uh, how that works. Any questions? So remember that for ionic solutes, we have to take into account dissolution for all of these things that we're calculating, okay? So um, sodium chloride, when we dissolve four formula units of, four, of sodium chloride, we actually get eight ions, right? So that's why we said that for sodium chloride, I was equal to two. Um, the eyes that we expect are not always exactly the eyes that we measure if we experimentally measure them, all right? They're usually a little bit smaller. Like for, for example, for sodium chloride, we would expect I to be two, but in reality it's 1.9. For magnesium chloride, we would expect I to be three, but it's really 2.7, okay? And so you see that there's a little deviation from the ideal. Why is that? That's because in solution, right, we assume complete ionization, right? So we say, ah, sodium chloride completely ionizes in solution. That's not completely true, all right? Most of them ionize, but there are some that stay paired uh, and that are attracted to each other by their plus and minus charges. It's a small number, but nonetheless, it's significant. And so you have what's called ion pairing, an ion pairing lowers I compared to what you would expect, all right? If, uh, so in your, in your problem set, just assume the, that the I is what you would expect based on the formula of the ionic compound, unless it says otherwise, okay? If the problem says otherwise, then, then it probably asking you to measure I, right? Or, or calculate I, but if it doesn't say otherwise, just, so for, if you had sodium chloride, use I equals two. If you have magnesium chloride, use I equals three and so on, okay? All right, one more question here.
Okay, uh, try to answer in the next few seconds. All right, so the osmotic pressure is equal to I times molarity times R times temperature. So here you have a bunch of different solutions. They all have the same molarity. They're all the same temperature, right? So the only difference is I, right? So this is a molecular compound. So what's I for a molecular compound? One. One, right? So I is one for that one. This is an ionic compound. It dissociates into three particles, right? Two potassium plus, one SO4, two minus. So what's I for this one? Three. Three. Predicted I for sodium chloride? Two. Two. Predicted I for iron chloride, iron three chloride? Four. Four, right? This has the highest I. Because it has the highest I, it would therefore have the highest osmotic pressure. Okay? Remember, all of these things that we're talking about are amplified in ionic compounds, and they're all amplified by this I, right? How many particles are produced compared to how many moles you have. Okay? All right, let me just show you how this works really quick with vapor pressure. Um, let's say you're trying to calculate the vapor pressure of water in an, ionic, in an ionic situation like this, okay? So remember that um, vapor pressure, so you're given here that you have 0.102 moles of calcium nitrate. You're given that you have 0.927 moles of water, and you're given that the vapor pressure of pure water is 118.1 torr, okay? And you got to find the vapor pressure of water in this solution. So remember that for vapor pressure of water, the, of a solution, sorry, the vapor pressure is equal to the mole fraction of the solvent times the vapor pressure of the pure solvent, right? So for a non-ionic solute, we just figure out chi and then we multiply it by and that gives us the vapor pressure. But in this case, we have an ionic solute, so we have to modify it. So what are we going to do? We're going to see that I for calcium nitrate is equal to three, right? Three. So when you figure out the mole fraction of water, you have to take that into account, right? So the mole fraction of water is moles of water divided by three times the number of moles of calcium nitrate plus the number of moles of water, right? So this makes the mole fraction of water lower than it would be otherwise, right? Sorry. Um, all right, and then lastly, uh, that cancels out and we get that the mole fraction of water is equal to 88.8 torr, okay? So the main thing to remember is that here you gotta take into account that I when you calculate the moles. Okay, last little piece of information here. Um, if, for those of you that wanna go into the medical profession, it's very important that you take into account osmotic pressure when you're delivering intravenous fluids, right? Why is that? Our, our, blo our blood is uh, basically an, a, a solution that contains dissolved sodium chloride plus a few other things, right? But contains dissolved, it's actually a salt, salt water solution that contains mostly sodium chloride plus a few other things. So it has some osmotic pressure, right? Based on how much sodium chloride is in there. So if you take a, a, a cell and uh, you put it into a solution, like this is a red blood cell. If you take a red blood cell and put it into a solution that has the same osmotic pressure as bodily fluids, that kind of solution is called isoosmotic, and the red blood cell looks normal, okay? If you put it into a hyperosmotic solution, that is a solution that has a higher osmotic pressure than bodily fluids, then the cell gets all shriveled up as the solution sucks pure water out of the cell, right? And that's very dangerous, right? So you wouldn't wanna give an IV solution that has a higher uh, osmotic pressure than bodily fluids. But you also wouldn't wanna give someone pure water in their blood. Why? Pure water 
would have a lower osmotic pressure, right, than the solution in the cell. So what happens is the cell actually draws the pure water to itself and it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And in fact, some of you might have done this kind of experiment in high school. I don't know if they do that anymore, but um, it'll draw the pure water into itself until the cell actually bursts, right? It'll explode, right? So giving someone pure water in, in their blood is it's, it's very, very dangerous, right? You always have to give them a sodium chloride solution that is isoosmotic with bodily fluids, okay? And the percentage, I think, is point, I think it's 0.9 something percent by mass sodium chloride. That's what is hyper, that is what is um, the same as bodily fluids. All right. Does that make sense? Questions? Questions, comments, curses, anything? Okay. Uh, so we actually ended up covering uh, the, the entire chapter just in two lectures. I, I sped it up a little bit because of Friday, but I'm still going to assign uh, a couple of videos to watch on Friday. There'll be a little bit of review. Um, so feel free to watch them if they're helpful. If they're not helpful, you don't have to watch it. Okay. But, um, but I'll send those out on an email um, today. So you have them for Friday. Uh, again, I won't, we won't have synchronous class on Friday. If you're having trouble and want some help on the problem set, feel free to send me an email or give me a, or send me a text message on my cell phone and we can set up a time to meet uh, on Friday to go over your questions on the problem set. Okay, there are some problems on the problem set that are a little bit tricky, all right? So, um, so, so have a look at those uh, before Friday and let me know if you need some help, all right? Any other questions before we finish up? All right, so uh, after Friday, we'll have been through two weeks of this. We got two more weeks and then we'll be back in person. All right, we're halfway through. Did I hear a question? Yeah, but um, people can go. Like, I don't want to hold everyone, but I just want you to go over how to find I again. Right. So all you got to do is look at the compound, look at the formula of the compound and determine when it ionizes, how many particles does it, does it form in solution? So sodium chloride, right? One mole of sodium chloride, when it ionizes, forms how many moles of ions? Two, right? One mole of iron, chlor iron chloride, when it ionizes, forms Fe3 plus plus 3Cl minus. So it forms one, two, three, four moles of particles. Oh, okay. Right, so, so you like, just have to get I from the formula of the compound. Oh, uh, okay. So like moles of particles is moles of individual ions. Correct, correct. Now, when you have a polyatomic ion, you gotta take those into account as well. So for example, K2SO4, ionizes to form 2K plus plus SO4 2 minus. So what's I for that compound? Three. Correct. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Of course. You're free to go unless you have questions. I'll stick around. Uh, so we're going to have in-person class next week, right? No in-person class next week. Okay, so still remain online. We'll remain online for two more weeks. Okay, okay. Yeah, they made it very hard for us to go back to in person until until um, the end of the end of January, basically. Okay, thank you. Bye bye. Yeah, bye. Uh, so, Professor, the recording uh, will be uploaded to Gaucho Space, right? Yeah, I will, um, you know what, I, I'll either upload it to Gaucho Space or I'll just send